welcome everybody to the panel four of today's session, uh, the changing terrorism environment in Africa. Uh, we have a really distinguished panel today because these individuals actually go out and do field work and do research in multiple languages in order to figure out exactly what is ongoing on the ground in Africa in terms of terrorism trends. What's most important to understand here is that Africa is in play across many terrorist groups because they have found safe haven in Africa and able to build up their capabilities as they have dispersed either from the Levant, for example, because of Islamic State, or because of Al-Qaeda and other cells that have developed across uh, Africa. This evolution of Sunni extremism is continuing and this new battleground is in Africa. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. And I first want to point out uh, our first speaker, Jacob Zen, who will be discussing militant movements in Sahel and Nigeria. Uh, Jacob just came out with one of the first books on this phenomena uh, that is based on field research. And this is what's key in terms of understanding the drivers on the ground in terms of being able to understand how to answer uh, issues related to countering terrorism. Jacob, please. Thank you very much, Ted. You couldn't have introduced this uh, subject any better. I'll be talking about Islamist militant movements in the Sahel and Nigeria. To start off, let's just take a look at the map of where we're talking about. First, we're talking about Nigeria. Uh, it's most important when we look at Boko Haram to look at the four country border region around Lake Chad, where you have Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. And then on the other side, you have Mali and its neighbors. And uh, most importantly, these days, we're talking about Niger and Burkina Faso to its south. The middle map features Burkina Faso in red. And that's important because that's the latest country to get hit very hard by jihadist movements. And uh, you know, one thing that jihadist movements do around the world is try to revive historical narratives about previous pre-colonial Islamic caliphates. Burkina Faso is not a country with a particularly deep Islamic history in that sense, whereas Mali has more of that deep Islamic history. And you know, that's why when Mali fell apart in 2012, 2013, you actually did see quite a number of foreign fighters from Egypt, from North Africa, and even some from South Asia. Uh, Burkina Faso, despite that it's in the process of collapsing right now, uh, is unlikely to see that type of foreign fighter mobilization because it doesn't really have those narratives. That being said, it makes a perfect base for jihadists throughout the region to set up camp, to base, and to try to launch attacks and to extend their movements into Niger and towards littoral West Africa. So keep these, mind, uh, keep these maps in mind as we continue the discussion in this presentation. So first we're talking about Islamic State in West Africa province, ISWAP. It's the strongest militant movement in Nigeria by far right now. In the first half of 2019, it was very strong. It raided a number of military barracks all throughout northeastern Nigeria one by one by one from about you know, April to June, and they released videos of these, they released photos of these, and it was disastrous. Nigeria responded in the second half of this year with what it calls the super camp strategy. This is where Nigeria took its soldiers out of these rural bases that were small and not well protected and that were able to be run over and consolidated their troops in major bases defending major towns. And this has been successful to the extent that ISWAP is not running over major bases at all right now. And Nigeria has accompanied that strategy with airstrikes on ISWAP camps. And uh, although this has reduced overall casualties, at least on the military side, according to my count, it has meant that the rural areas are more in ISWAP's hand and more in an unobstructed way. And that allows ISWAP to try to win over the civilian population. I mean, that was the cost-benefit analysis that Nigeria had to make at the time. And uh, you know, airstrikes alone are not gonna be enough to defeat ISWAP. And therefore, for the time being, we can consider ISWAP a group that is predominant, especially in Borno State and to an extent Yobe. And you know, the military is just camped in its major bases guarding towns. This dynamic is not gonna be unfamiliar to anyone who studied insurg insurgency in other environments around the world. But uh, one thing that's important to note is that ISWAP is 99% just in Borno and Yobe and the borderlands of the neighboring countries. 
This is no longer like it was in 2012 when attacks were hitting the center of Nigeria or all, all throughout northern Nigeria. Now, one important dynamic to note, however, is that ISWAP is attempting to build networks in northwestern Nigeria, the part that's closer to Burkina Faso and the part that's closer to Niger, and that's only a few hundred miles away from Mali. ISWAP claimed one attack in Sokoto, in far northwestern Nigeria, a few months ago in the Al Naba magazine of ISIS, and it claimed to have organized that attack from Niger. So that was sort of uh, an example of how ISWAP is attempting to make that move. One reason for making the move to northwest Nigeria is, is the money from trafficking, uh, from banditry, from stealing, to fund the movement in northeastern Nigeria. However, I would argue there's also two internal organizational reasons for shifting to northwest Nigeria. One is that in March 2019, ISIS announced a new leader for ISWAP. And that meant that the former leader, Abu Musab al-Barnawi, who's the son of the original leader who was killed in 2009, was demoted. And I think some members of ISWAP now feel marginalized because there was a leadership coup against Abu Musab al-Barnawi, and they don't feel comfortable being in northeastern Nigeria where they can be purged or killed. So it might be safer, them to, safer for them to move to northwestern Nigeria. Also. Like other jihadist groups, ISIS, ISWAP faces the issue of growing extremism, growing takfirism. Their videos are emblematic of how brutal they are, you know, typical of ISIS in Syria, shooting RPGs into the face of captured soldiers, for example. And as a result of growing extremism in ISWAP, I think some of the more moderates want to get out of there, and that's why they might be relocating to northwestern Nigeria. Now, in, in general, as I've noted, in the second half of 2019, things have been relatively calm, but typical of any intelligent insurgents, as ISWAP are, they are just recalibrating and trying to decide their next step. As mentioned before, in 2012, they operated throughout northern Nigeria, then they you know, consolidated to northeastern Nigeria. By 2015, they took territory, and they're trying to decide to where to make their move next. And, and I think northwestern Nigeria is part of that calibration. Uh, it's also important to note that as a result of the military moving away from rural areas, ISWAP has publicly announced that we're going to attack roadways. And that's why it's been increasing hostage takings. And one thing that's important to note for probably people in this room is that NGOs are absolutely not off limits. They've announced that we will capture the Red Cross, which means all NGOs, and we saw them capture eight action against hunger workers a few months ago. And, and that's what that picture on that slide is. It's the action against hunger captives. They killed one of them because negotiations didn't work out. And uh, the slide in the, the picture in the middle is ISWAP wearing Nigerian military uniforms from helmet to boot. And that's just emblematic of how problematic it is for the Nigerian soldiers and even the civilians. You don't know who's a soldier and who's ISWAP. And then the, the other one is ISWAP's pledge to Baghdadi before he was killed. And that, I would argue, is one of the more extreme factions of the group. Notably, the most extreme leader, Abu Bakr Shakao, who I'll talk about in a, in a moment, he always does his videos like that. And the fact that ISWAP is mocking his style suggests to me that some members of ISWAP are moving back towards the ultra Tikfiri style. The three other important groups to discuss are the group originally called Boko Haram, that's no longer allied with ISIS, this new faction called Bakura, and Ansaru. Now, the, the Boko Haram faction, that, that is not ISWAP, it's led by Abu Bakr Shakao. For anyone familiar with ultra Tekfiri jihadi ideology, whether the GIA in Algeria in the 90s or the hardline factions of ISIS, he's just the same, viewing any Muslim who doesn't join his group as an infidel, and anyone who doesn't call an infidel those Muslims becomes an infidel themselves, which leads to an en en endless cycle of infidel infidelity, uh, or chain Tekfir. So, uh, and, and that's what Shakao is like. He will not change his ideology for anything, and he's just the same as he always has been. But this is a limitation on his group's ability to grow. However, I don't see his group's demise for the reason that they've been fighting for 10 years and the children born 15 years ago are soon going to be starting to fight. And they will have an endless supply of new children that will become fighters. So even if they had only 700 or 1,000 fighters now, they'll always be able to replenish with a cult of Shikau, steeped in the hardline Salafi jihadism. Um, one way that they can make money or get supplies is these constant raids into Cameroon. If you're trying to cut off their supply line, I think it's largely been done because they're not raiding Maiduguri, the capital of Borno, so much. They're not raiding Adamawa State so much, but they keep on going into Cameroon almost every day, and that's how they can uh, help replenish. Now, one of the curious things is that, although I would argue that this group is limited in, in its ability to expand, they are growing around Lake Chad, which is actually several hundred miles from southern Borna, where their base is. Now, how is this happening? I would argue it's not happening organically, but it's happening through an alliance with this other faction called Bakura. 
Um, and, and lastly, I'll just note that, that although uh, this faction of Boko Haram has been kicked out of ISIS because it was actually too extreme, they still maintain loyalty to ISIS. ISIS just doesn't recognize them. And when they claim attacks, they copy ISIS his own uh, formatting and templates. So they view themselves actually as the legitimate ISIS province. Now this Bakura faction is a little bit curious, but here's something to note. Uh, in the middle of this year, there was a major barracks attack in Dangdala, Chad, 24 soldiers killed. Uh, after that, there was a major attack in Darak, Cameroon, about 17 Cameroonian soldiers killed. And even more recently, there was a major attack in Blabrin, Niger. None of those were claimed by ISWAP, but it was in ISWAP territory. However, just a few weeks ago, uh, Boko Haram released a video claiming at least the Dangdala and Darak attack, and they released a written statement claiming the Niger attack. So it doesn't make sense that Boko Haram has spread from southern Borno all the way to the Lake Chad surroundings and conducted these major operations. What I would argue is happening is that this Bakura faction, which is comprised of longtime smugglers and traffickers around Lake Chad that have operated for decades, is allying with Chad. And uh, I think that you can also look at this in ethnic dynamics, where ISWAP can appeal to all ethnicities of Nigeria. Shakao is predominantly Kanuri, that's a Borno-based ethnicity, and Bakura is arguably other ethnicities, like Buduma, minority ethnicities around like Chad. And it isn't that Bakura's faction is extreme or not extreme, they don't really have an ideology, they're just criminals. And so they don't work well with ISWAP because ISWAP says you can do this and you can't do that. ISWAP has a, you know, a moderate or at least limits. Shakao has no limits, so you can do whatever you want. And Bakura's faction is therefore suitable for allying with Shikau. And I think one thing we've seen as a result of this is not only those three major attacks, but a surge in abduction of young women in Niger. This is against ISWAP ideology. They don't approve of uh, slavery. Um, but I think Bakura's faction is the one who's responsible for the surge of abduction of young women in Niger. And Shikau has no problem with that because those women are not Muslims in the first place because they're infidels for not joining his group. And so I think that is what is allowing Shikau to expand his reach into the Lake Chad region, surprisingly. Lastly, you have the Ansaru faction. This is the Al-Qaeda loyal faction. It emerged from AQIM, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, trained Nigerians. It, it, it needs to run away from the Northeast because uh, Shikau or even ISWAP will kill them. So they are just in the Northwest of Nigeria right now. They're trying to get bandits to join their cause, but the bandits in the Northwest are not particularly ideological. So what Ansaru will depend on with its Fulani-oriented strategy is regional destabilization, and then like the Fulani jihadists in Mali today, it can then bring the bandits in its fold in a state of instability. Right now, Ansaru is just waiting for the time to rebuild its network, and it remains loyal to Al-Qaeda. So in the prospectus for Nigeria, here's the one good note. If you looked at the Nigerian Salafi clerics in the early 2000s, they were pro-Taliban, they were pro-Al-Qaeda, they were pro-Bin Laden, they were talking about hard Sharia, no one's like that anymore. Boko Haram has been its own antidote. The Salafi clerics that used to be pro Bin Laden are basically pacifist. And in their rhetoric, they're basically even acknowledging their past mistakes. I would say almost all of them. So you don't actually have a violent extremist ideological problem within the Muslim clerical establishment in Nigeria anymore. But you do have the major problem of Boko Haram and ISWAP, which is an outgrowth of their previous ideological uh, statements. Uh, so the issue is not countering violent extremism so much as countering ISWAP and Boko Haram particularly. I don't think that Salafi jihadi ideology is pervasive among the mainstream establishment anymore. Uh, Nigeria needs to worry about the, the conflict from Mali spilling over, especially in the Ansaru case. Uh, I don't think you can defeat ISWAP and Boko Haram. They're too strong, too embedded now, but you can contain them. Right now they're somewhat contained. And you need to ask yourself, you know, these groups like Boko Haram and ISWAP, they used to attack central Nigeria very frequently in 2012. Now they don't do it any, at all. I don't think it's because they don't have the capabilities. But we need to ask ourselves, is ISWAP strategically restraining itself or is Nigeria counterterrorism working? I think it's a little bit of both, but it is partly that ISWAP does not want to do anything too drastic that would force the U.S. and France to get involved and to crack down upon them like what they saw happen to their brothers in Iraq and Syria. Negotiation is not possible for any peace. Nobody's talking about it. But you can make these transactional deals, like in this picture here, where Boko Haram exchanged a pastor. But the problem with these deals is that they're very humanitarian in nature. But if you do, are giving them money for these deals, they can incessantly capture people and make a few thousand dollars or more from these deals. And I can't blame people for doing it, but this is just a one way for these groups to continue to fundraise. They can unlimit, uh, ca capture people in unlimited fashion and mm -hmm. make deals. Uh, lastly, the I I AQIS dynamics require attention. If AQ is able to rebuild a foothold, we could see new tactics in the region. Now, regarding Mali, Burkina, and Niger, there's just a few main comments I would make. You have two groups, 
Islamic State in Greater Sahara, which is ISGS, and JNIM, which translates to Group for Supporters of Islam and Muslims. The first is obviously allied with ISIS. The latter is obviously allied with uh, Al-Qaeda. And I ISGS is actually subsumed organizationally under ISWAP. So when it claims attacks, it does it under ISWAP. So it's like a branch of ISWAP. The, the key difference, I would say, is that ISGS is erratic, but when it carries out major attacks, they are very major, like 71 Malian soldiers killed yesterday. Just before that, 40 uh, workers for a Burkina mine run by Canada also killed. Uh, and just a few weeks before that, there was like 50 soldiers in Mali killed in an ISGS raid. And before that, there was another one. So they're not as consistent as JNIM, but when they carry out a major attack, it is major and it's devastating. And, and it has huge political implications. It also claimed knocking down the French uh, airliner, uh, Air, Air Force um, flight that killed 12 French soldiers a few weeks ago, even though JNIM says that it wasn't really ISGS. Nonetheless, they're very dangerous, and I attribute this a little bit to the ghost of Mokhaldar, Bel Mokhtar. The, the leader of ISGS is, minutes. yeah, I'm almost done, no is uh, Abu Adnan Walid al Sahrawi. He was a co-leader of Belmukhtar with al Marabi Tun, which they formed in mid-2013, not related to the Egypt one. And so they, ha they have some of this DNA of Belmukhtar in them because some of their leaders collaborated with him in Mali back in 2013. So I think that's why sometimes you can find ISGS carrying out these major special operations attacks that Belmukhtar was so famous at doing. As far as we know, Belmukhtar is dead or hiding or captured. You know, no one knows where he actually is. That's why I call it his ghost. Now, as for JNIM, the uh, Al-Qaeda group in Mali, th they do carry out big attacks. They, carry, they attack international targets, local tor targets, but uh, they're more consistent. You know, day by day, a more of a typical insurgent trying to embed locally. They're certainly bigger than ISGS, but they maybe don't have that capability to do these master masterful special operations like ISGS. That being said, neither of these two groups are hostile with each other because AQIM itself, which is actually the umbrella, you know, uh, origin of both of these groups, AQIM knows how to deal with factions. It has a lot of history with Abu Zaid and ba Bal Mokhtar fighting each other, and so they can work with each other. They're not as hostile in the Sahel as IS and AQ are in, for example, Syria, or even uh, when you talk about uh, mm. ISIS and the Taliban, which are very hostile. And uh, I think one of the latest strategies worthy of note is that JNIM is going after traditional village leaders, traditional imams, trying to destroy the original, you know, the traditional Muslim establishment because they tend to be allied with the government. And that has really important effects for society, for religious authority, and for JNIM's attempt to build itself into a religious authority, especially through the Fulani establishment. And the prospectus for the Sahel is, is that's different from, say, the Middle East, is there's no big state that can bail out the region. You can't, the U.S. is not going to do it. France is definitely as extended as it can be in Mali, let alone Burkina Faso, and who knows if this will bleed over to Niger. France can't get the job done. Countries like Germany and Italy don't have the history in the region, nor do they have the capacity or resources to stomp this out. So that's really the big problem. There's no state that's going to come here and, and solve the problem like you <coughs> have in the Middle East. Um, one of the also challenges for jihadists in the Sahel is that there's so many vigilante groups, ethnic militias, pro-government militias, that there's, it's actually a real hodgepodge. In Nigeria and Northeast, it's ISWAP versus the government. So it's actually a little bit more straightforward. For the jihadists, they need to fight not only the government, but all these other actors. So it actually makes it a little bit harder for the jihadists to take over. At the same time, it also makes it harder for the government to become the authority because it's dealing with all of these violent non-state organizations as well. Uh, Burkina Faso, as I mentioned in the beginning, is the latest country under a major threat. Niger has kept its hold, but it's a regional linchpin. It is what stands between Nigeria and Burkina and Mali. It has managed to keep the crises at bay, but how long it can continue do, to do that is questionable. And uh, my final thoughts are that, you know, since uh, the mid-2000s, people have talked about the arc of instability and how it's overblown and it's not going to happen in the Sahel. But you do have the expansion from Mali into Burkina into the tips of Niger. And the fact that ISWAP is trying to build up the northwest base really puts these groups very close to each other. Moreover, organizationally, ISWAP and ISGS are officially the same. So, I mean, if Niger falls, you will actually have a bleeding over of both conflicts together. For the time being, they remain separate. When Mali fell apart in 2012, which in itself was related to the Libya crisis, we, we've seen terrible aftermath that continues to today. Burkina Faso is on the precipice. If you're looking at future scenarios, you need to think about what will happen if, if Ouagadougou uh, collapses the capital. Uh, what if the military has a coup? 
What if the military revolts against the government? These are all possibilities. Uh, countries like Togo, Benin, and Ghana are also seeing uh, jihadists literally on their borderlands. Those countries are ready for it. There's already been ISGS operations in Benin to kidnap uh, a few uh, tourists that, that were later saved. But I mean, within the next three years in this conference, I'm sure we'll be talking about these countries being hit with some type of jihadist attack. And uh, lastly, you know, on a more theoretical level, what does Baghdadi's death mean? What does the ISAQ relations mean for this region? Uh, I would suggest that we continue to think about how those scenarios will play, well, play themselves out, and we can talk about that in Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, that was a really good presentation because what it did was is it mixes together the on-the-ground aspect in terms of ethnography and how that matches with jihadist pockets, if you will. And I think that this is an area that needs to be understood better by mapping ethno uh, ethnographic factors and tribes and so on, if you, if you will, across this part of Africa. Moving on, we're going to now, uh, the next two presentations are almost tied together because we're going to be looking at North Africa and a different type of landscape than that you see in West Africa, if you will, um, depending on your point of view, of course. So next we're going to go to Dario Cristiani, uh, who is going to talk about the Libyan chaos and North African instability, followed by Sergei Sukhanov, who's going to talk about Russian mercenaries in Africa. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and so we're going to go to those two presentations now. Please, Dario, uh, begin. Is it working here? Or? Yeah. OK, perfect. So thank you very much for having me here. This is the first time that I'm not traveling all the way from either Tunisia or Europe, because I'm actually based here in the sea now, here at the, uh, with the German Marshall Fund with this uh, in, in the Sahel and West Africa. It's mostly about non-state actors. In Libya, actually, the situation, we could say, uh, up until a few years ago, it was mostly about non-state actors. The situation now is different, because it's about Libyan actors. It's about non-state actors uh, linked to the region, but also to the Middle East. And it's a lot more about state actors than it used to be until I would say a few years ago. Why? Because Libya is a very highly, is a highly internationalized conflict in which you can clearly see a number of countries supporting like the two sides that are now fighting in, in Libya. Um, and this international dimension is very much connected to uh, the conflict that emerged after April. Why I stress the point that April, like April 4, created like a completely new environment in the Libyan conflict, it's because with the uh, attack from Haftar forces to Western uh, Libya, like the chances for like a political settlement that were ongoing in March, like we were, we were at the time before the national conference that was supposed to take place in Libya by, by mid-April. Mm -hmm. uh, and like this attack also on the one hand has created like the condition for a further straining of the relations between Haftar forces and groups in the West. Uh, there is like an entire, like if you speak to Libyans and especially like if you see um, the situation now in the hospitals also in Tunis with all the people who are arriving like injured from Libya, there is like an increasing resentment among Libyans themselves. Something that also if the civil war was significantly like bitter before April, this level of like uh, much mutual accusation was not as strong as it is now. Uh, then there is uh, like the idea that f from the Haftar side, he made clear like several in several interviews, but also with the ongoing military action that he doesn't really see like a negotiated solution as the solution for Libya, but he see himself as being the solution for Libya. And 
he is supported by a number of external countries that some of them, they have specific security interests linked to the situation in Libya. I think Egypt is the first country like uh, that we can uh, uh, mention. But there are also some other countries like the United Arab Emirates or France and more and more Russia. Although <coughs> Russia is a bit of a peculiar case in Libya because um, now is very much involved with the Haftar side, but uh, it, it was the, the country that was able to talk to all the Libyan factions at some point, the only one that was able to do so. Uh, the GNA, the government of the National Accord, is the UN-backed government and is trying to defend Tripoli, or better, the militias that are linked to the GNA are trying to defend Tripoli from, uh, from this um, military attack, but the GNA can actually save its presence in Tripoli, but cannot do anything more. There is no possibility, given the forces on the ground, that the militias can actually push and attack Haftar forces in the east. There might be something around the certain, the so-called oil crescent, where there are most of the oil resources of Libya, with some misrata. Uh, like militias that have been there since they intervened to defeat the Islamic State, but that would be very limited. So from this point of view, we are witnessing like a war of attrition uh, between these two blocs, uh, and each side is supported by external actors. I mentioned the actors that are supporting um, Haftar, but the GNA, especially after April, mm -hmm. has received a significant support from Turkey. And basically, without the Turkish uh, intervention, it would have been impossible for the GNA to, to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you are wondering, there is an uh, ongoing arm embargo in Libya. Is anyone respecting it? No. Like, let's put it this very, very clear on the, uh, on the, on the ground. Uh, then, there were also other countries that were supportive of the GNA among European countries. The first country that we could mention is Italy, although Italy uh, has tried to strike like a balance between Haftar and the GNA with the conference in Palermo. And this attempt uh, brought Italy some problems because it didn't manage to mend ties with Haftar, but at the same time it lost the, conf the trust of some of the groups in, in Western Libya. Uh, then, like all the Western uh, Maghrebi countries, Algeria, Tunisia, uh, they are also against the, uh, aggr the military operation from the East because for them, they are afraid that uh, Libya, uh, like uh, in a perennial state of war, can represent a security threat. In the case of Tunisia, this is even more significant if you think about the amount of Libyans living in the, in the country, <coughs> like in several areas in Tunis, but even more also in the Sahel of, of Tunisia. Like when I say Sahel in Tunisia, I mean uh, Hamamet, uh, Nebel, uh, um, um, Monastir, etc., and and the south. And, and then in the case of Algeria, like today there were the elections in Algeria. It seems no one here in DC noticed that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Algeria is going through a very like complex phase of like um, I, I wouldn't even say transition but like a sort of reassess post Bouteflika reassessment so like just to um, the the groups in uh, in Libya are very diversified and there is an important element that we should uh, when talking about Libya and the conflict there is always this idea that a lot of people who actually mm. think it's smart to say ah if there are problems, I mean, we can divide Libya into three, like Vilayet, the three Ottoman provinces, and all of a sudden peace will reappear. It's not, it was not that easy in 2011. It was not that easy in 2015 at the time of the political process that brought, that from which the GNA emerged. It's not so easy now, especially because if we look at the people fighting on each side, we find even cities and tribes that are divided between pro-Haftar people and anti-Haftar people. And here I actually stress the anti-Haftar element because many of the militias fighting in Western Tripoli, they are not really fighting for the GNA. 
It's not about saving uh, Al Sarraj. They are fighting against an, a political actor that they perceive as the real threat. So here I'm like among the allies of uh, Haftar in, in, West, uh, in West Libya. There are the Kanyat, which is this militia uh, organized by the Kani family and Mohsen Akani. He was killed, I think, in September. And this militia was essential for Haftar to launch his military operation in, in West Libya. Adel Daab, who was the key militia leader that allowed Haftar to launch uh, the military operation on, uh, on April 4. And in 2014, he was fighting alongside <laughs> the groups in West Libya against Haftar. Uh, then we, here I have uh, Abdelmonem uh, Dardira, who is a major um, military player from, from Zintan. And Zintan as well, as we can see, there is a pro-Haftar Zintan uh, like uh, group, and there is a pro jna uh, Zintan group led by Oslam, uh, Osama al-Juwaili who used to be the former Minister of Defense immediately after the, uh, the, the, the revolution. Um, it, from this point of view, like, we can see that also among the Haftar-like side, there are several groups that we can connect to Salafism. Uh, the the Makdali version here, I don't really have time to enter into this debate, <laughs> but we have witnessed in, in Libya the emergence of a number of very interesting streams of political Islam over the past few years. And the interesting thing is that this happened when the classic branch of political Islam, like the Muslim Brothers, has started to a certain extent losing centrality. Uh, we saw that when uh, Khalid al-Mishri, he resigned from being part of the Muslim Brothers, although like, it doesn't mean that they are completely irrelevant in the current uh, conflict. And then uh, there was this, um, how can I say, there were these rumors back in the days of the, the attack in April that Haftar was about to strike a deal with a number of militia leaders from Tripoli in order to enter uh, in Tripoli without like firing a bullet. There were rumors that the leader, uh, the leaders like Aitam Tajuri <coughs> or uh, Al Kikli, they were talking with Haftar. There were like here I'm mentioning like Tripoli at the moment there are four major militias that are, how can I say, divide, uh, um, have the control of the entire city. And here I'm just mentioning the, the actual leaders. I don't want to enter into the debate because then we can also see that some of the, uh, of the revolutionaries fighting in these militias, they intervene against the leaders when there was the perception that there were negotiations ongoing because many of these revolutionaries, they are actually from the local neighborhoods, and they would never allow, um, better, their goal is to avoid a military takeover from like groups from uh, coming from Eastern Libya at the moment. And the operation in April also created the conditions for a sort of impossible alliance between all the militias that were fighting between the, themselves before, and the first name coming up to my mind is Salah Badi, this Mizratan leader who considered himself to be the George Washington of Libya. Uh, he said that in several interviews in the past, and he was fighting against the JNA because he was supportive of the previous like uh, National Salvation Government of Khalifa Gwell, who is in exile, I think, now in Istanbul. And now, instead, Salah Badi is fighting alongside the JNA. Uh, in this picture, where is the Islamic State? The Islamic State was actually, uh, was in Syria until 2016, then it was um, uh, defeated and reorganized mm -hmm. in the desert to carry out a number of hit and run attacks. Mm -hmm. It was on the rise until, uh, I would say, June, uh, July. They even managed to return, like, uh, operating in Derna, from which, uh, like, the forces of Haftar dislodged them in the past, but after September, they went quiet again. Uh, why? <coughs> there were these three airstrikes from uh, African forces, and like on this, of course, there are no confirmation, but it seems that most of their soldiers were 
killed in these attacks. And then, like the other big regional jihadi player, AQAM, in Libya, he's, I wouldn't say it's absent, because it's not. It's present in southern Libya. But it perceives Libya more as a logistic platform rather than actually a territory in which carrying out attacks. It's a logistic platform to support its presence in, in the Sahel. Then, um, all, how all this play in the, in the regional dynamics? I would say at the moment that security issues in terms of terrorism are less significant mm -hmm. for the countries in, uh, in uh, the western <coughs> part of North Africa than socioeconomic issues. Why? Because uh, in Tunisia, in Algeria, in Morocco, the real problems like I would say are uh, this socioeconomic disparities, this perception of the people of not being uh, like taken into consideration. And we can see clearly that Tunisia aside, but Tunisia is a very peculiar case because like there are these rather unsophisticated attacks every now and then that nevertheless have a significant impact because in Tunisia there is a, there is a perception of uh, uh, I would say a sort of structural weakness of the country that, to give an example, when there were uh, these attacks in, uh, when there were these attacks in um, the double attack on, the, on June 27, many Tunisians described this, uh, this Friday, because it, happened, no, it was a Thursday, they described that as a Black Thursday. This is a reference to an historical event in Tunisia in which a lot of people were killed during a strike in 1978, like these two events cannot actually be compared because the two attacks in this June were not very significant. Still, that was the perception because there is this idea of of a sort of like country on the brink of uh, uh, of of the drama. That's why I use this word, this expression, endless paranoia. I have it here. Mm -hmm. I don't have it there. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Like. Uh, um, so, like, when it comes to the regional environment, I would say that at the moment, more than the threats coming from non-state actors, the real, like, interesting trend, and Libya is part of this trend, is the return of great power competition in North Africa and how this can play out in this kind of environment. Of all the countries I mentioned on Libya, there's one country I didn't mention, which is China. But China and Libya doesn't really have a role at the moment. But China is increasingly have a having a role in Morocco, in Tunisia, etc. So there is the non-state actor element, which remains an important element of the regional environment. But the North African instability will be linked more and more to great power competition, because there is this significant perception in the region that the United States are about to leave now. True or not, I'm not here to question this. I'm talking about the perception and the impact of this perception. So non-state actors that are less relevant than in the past and an increasing great power competition in which Libya, of which Libya is a great example, but that will emerge also in other regional uh, theaters. Sorry if I spoke for more than uh, like. That's OK. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It was very useful. Uh, I just want to point out that the external actors that are getting into Libya, just as they did in Syria, all play with this definition of who is a terrorist. And depending on which side is dealing with whom, one person's <coughs> terrorist is another person's freedom fighter or fighter, or whatever word you want to throw in there. With that, I, we will go to Sergei, who will discuss the Russian perspective on Africa and its actions through <coughs> Wagner and other PMCs. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, my name is Sergei Stokhankin, and uh, I've been working uh, on the topic of Russian PMCs for uh, over a year. And uh, thanks to the Jamestown, we are now completing, I dare say, the first project of this type uh, on the Russian PMCs that takes this uh, longitudinal approach not just some operative stuff, but uh, which builds a connection, uh, a nexus between the past, uh, some historical pages, and uh, some current developments, uh, and also some potential future developments. Uh, so I decided to build my present, 
I decided to build my presentation on uh, five main pillars. So first, I will discuss Russia, uh, Russia's role in Africa, its uh, continuity and tradition. Uh, secondly, I will speak about uh, Kremlin's strategic objectives in Africa. Thirdly, I will try to elaborate on uh, Russia's competitive advantage, something that Russia might use in order to f boost uh, its uh, position and its role in Africa. Uh, then I will reflect on Russian PMCs and why and how they're different from uh, its Western counterparts. And in the final analysis, uh, I will very briefly, I'm not sure if I will be able to do that or not, but now I will try to cover some of uh, the selected uh, cases uh, related to Russia's activities uh, in Africa uh, and PMCs as one of the uh, main, one of the crucial tools uh, employed by the Kremlin, by employed by Moscow to promote its uh, interests in Africa. Uh, so point number one, element number one. Um, uh, the USSR and Russia a in uh, Africa and uh, this nexus between what the USSR did uh, and how it is related, how it is connected to what Russia is trying to do today. Uh, so basically, during the before 1991, uh, the, uh, the Soviets were present in a good half, uh, physically present basically, the military advisors were present in half of African countries. Uh, but uh, in the end of the day, we have to admit that uh, the Soviet strategy in Africa was uh, in many ways heavily driven by ideology and there was a great deal of uh, irrational behavior of the Soviet Union. So in the end of the day, if we measure the real achievements uh, of the Soviets in Africa, we'll see that uh, by 1991, uh, Moscow had basically had to abandon uh, many countries and uh, by 1991, uh, the Soviet posture in Africa uh, was not as strong uh, as one might think here in the West. Uh, one of the best examples here would be the um, the example of uh, Angola. Uh, why Angola? Well, the Soviet well, Moscow tried to build, tried to convert uh, Angola into an exemplary uh, pro-Soviet state mm -hmm. Uh, that would uh, heavily rely on the Soviet Union both in terms of domestic policy making and foreign policy making. And what we can see here is that between 1975 <laughs> and 1991, approximately 11,000 uh, military advisors, Soviet military advisors, along with uh, some 35,000 Cuban troops uh, were present in Angola. And here we can see how impressive uh, was the uh, representation of the Soviet side in Angola. Um, PMC's wise or mercenary wise, I would say that uh, the late 80s were crucial because what we can see today in Libya uh, and in other countries, it basically took uh, the roots from this period. Uh, the Soviet military advisors started acting as uh, the de facto mercenaries in Libya uh, in the late 1980s, and they were receiving financial means from the Gaddafi government, and they were fighting basically in all border wars uh, that Libya waged uh, in this within this period. After 1991, uh, many of them, some 5,000 people, chose to stay in Libya and uh, keep on uh, continue uh, their service. Now there was not just the Russians, also Ukrainians. Uh, people from Kazakhstan, from Belarus, so basically from the uh, post-Soviet area, uh, chose to stay in Libya and continue uh, their service for Gaddafi. Uh, now let us uh, let us turn to Kremlin's uh, strategic objectives in Africa, because this should provide uh, some contextual uh, background, some explanation, some better explanation to why Kremlin is strategically interested in. Africa primarily uh, now uh, the growth of interest in the sub-Saharan Africa is visible. So uh, element number one, uh, it pertains to uh, geoeconomic interests. Everyone knows, uh, it's basically a common knowledge that uh, Russia is, has abundance of natural resources. But in fact, Africa does have many minerals that uh, Russia either does not have or the extraction of these resources in, in uh, Russia in comparison to Africa will be at least five to ten times more expensive. And uh, now if we, if we read, if we go through the main publications written by Russian economists, <coughs> uh, even military elites, we'll see that 
uh, one of the key concerns, one of the main interests that Russia has in sub-Saharan Africa, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, are its abundant minerals. And at the same time, Africa offers uh, or is perceived by the Russian side as a new market for Russia's uh, non-raw material sector uh, because uh, Africa is basically one of very few places uh, where Russia can export uh, its uh, products, uh, manufactured products, IT, uh, and uh, other items uh, that are uncompetitive uh, if it comes to uh, bilateral or multilateral trade of the Russian Federation with other players. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, secondly, geopolitical interests. Uh, so uh, we all saw that uh, during the, uh, after the inception of the Libyan uh, civil war and Syrian civil wars, uh, the uh, migration crisis in Europe uh, created such ripples and uh, huge ripples and in Moscow that was seen uh, as a, a potential leverage that could be used by the Russian side against the European Union, uh, individual member states and uh, the European Union as a whole uh, to make it more docile. Uh, the voting power, it's one of the w w relatively new elements uh, that is now being entertained by Russian thinkers. Uh, if we take a look at the United Nations, the composition of the United Nations, we'll see that uh, the African countries have a great deal of votes and uh, the Russian side sees uh, this element as a, a counterbalance against uh, what they call uh, an, uh, an attempt of the West to isolate Russia in uh, major international institutions. And from uh, some uh, information that we have today, uh, Russia sees uh, or at least makes this impression uh, that it makes uh, Africa, some African countries, as a potential platform for strengthening uh, cooperation and ties uh, with uh, the Chinese. Uh, so in terms of competitive advantage, uh, well, Russia does have a number of tools, a number of instruments uh, that uh, the West uh, is not using. Uh, the methods uh, that the Russian side is uh, using, uh, they are uh, well, acceptable in Africa, and here we can see a merger combination between private military companies and some non-military uh, means such as propaganda, PR campaigns, uh, electoral campaigns. Uh, marketing, sp well, speaking in terms of marketing, excellent targeting and segmentation of the audience uh, where Russia basically uh, creates, pursues this uh, two-pronged approach uh, both in terms of uh, division of the countries and uh, in terms of uh, uh, items uh, and uh, products that Russia is um, s sending, s uh, selling to African <coughs> countries. And finally, one of the most interesting concepts uh, where the role of PMCs and uh, Russia's weaponry is instrumental is the so-called security expert concept, uh, something that was elaborated during the Waldai Forum, Waldai Summit, and uh, Russia sees itself as a potential guarantor. Well, it's, of course, it's a Russian view of this concept uh, of peace and uh, stability in uh, Africa. Starting from, starting from 2016, um, uh, 2017, 18, uh, Russia has concluded a number of uh, more than 20 uh, military technical agreements with African countries and basically what we can see here is that for now, for today, uh, this uh, expert of security is one of the main drivers, is one of the most powerful tools uh, that uh, Russia can use, can employ uh, in its uh, advance in Africa. Uh, and yes, here is another map uh, that uh, shows material wealth and endowment of African countries. Uh, and. Uh, miraculously, the most uh, endowed countries in terms of the minerals, uh, rare minerals are the main sites, the main platforms uh, where uh, the Russian side, Russian PMCs are operating. Now, just a couple, uh, couple of words about what Russian PMCs are. Uh, and uh, yeah, I know that uh, it may take a lot of time. So I've selected two main, uh, basically two quotations uh, that uh, do explain the uh, the essence, the core of this phenomenon. The first one comes from um, Alexander Perenjiev, uh, who is who represented 
represents the officers of Russian movement, which is uh, related to a Russian PMC industry. And the second one is uh, was coined by a uh, well-known Russian Africanist, Sergei Yeladinov, who now lives, I believe, in uh, Senegal, uh, who actually uh, stated that uh, the Russian PMCs didn't go, Russian, sorry, uh, presence did not uh, evaporate after 1991. Uh, it just transformed, it just changed its um, uh, some of the main f uh, shapes. So private military contractors a la Russe. So what is this? Well, the most important, the most uh, interesting element uh, that uh, differentiates uh, this phenomenon from what we have in the West or in uh, South Africa or in Israel is that uh, Russian PMCs are de jure non-existent. So, in fact, we don't have private military companies in Russia. Uh, moreover, they are prohibited uh, by the, uh, by the Russian uh, penal code, legal code. Uh, so, um, what uh, in the outset, in the very beginning of uh, the Ukrainian crisis, uh, when confronted with this question about Russian PMC, Sergei Shaigu said, uh, you can't catch a black cat in the dark room, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so first ideas uh, about uh, creation of PMCs, they were coined around 2010, but of course, uh, at the time, they didn't receive a huge boost. Uh, it was the Ukrainian crisis that uh, transformed uh, Russia's uh, perception and uh, the way how Russian, uh, Russia's, uh, in Russians intended to use uh, private military companies. Uh, over the years, so starting from 2000, late 2013 and early 2014, uh, right until today, they have, uh, had, they have gained significant military experience uh, in Syria and in Ukraine, and in these countries, at least there, they acted uh, quite effectively and quite efficiently. Uh, Russian private military companies uh, can be used as a multifunctional instrument, uh, so they can render physical protection uh, to the local leaders. They can render military consultancy services, something that we've seen in Syria, uh, in uh, some sub-Saharan Africans, uh, some sub-Saharan, uh, some sub-Saharan African countries, uh, and they can also act as a, a pure military force, like in Ukraine and in Syria, and today we can see this uh, in Libya, and of course they can render some training services. What we have seen in the Central African Republic, uh, primarily in the Central African Republic, uh, what makes them efficient and um, very much a desired commodity is this balance uh, between price and quality. Uh, recently we received some information that in Mozambique uh, the Russian contractors were m managed to beat other bidders uh, from South Africa and uh, apparently what the Russian press says from the United States. Uh, why? Well, most important, not because of the high level of professionalism or anything else, it was the price. Uh, the Russian side, uh, the Russian contractor, they charged three, four times uh, less uh, money for their services and promised to get things done. And, and as we will see uh, in my presentation and uh, later on, uh, some bumps occurred along the road. Uh, so, um, and here, just as a summary, <coughs> just as a summary, uh, three main capabilities, th three main functions uh, that uh, the Russian private military contractors can perform. So first of all, military and paramilitary functions, uh, something that we have seen uh, in Syria, in Ukraine, uh, well now in Libya, in Mozambique. Uh, most importantly, that this complies with uh, the so-called, we can deny this term, with Gerasimov doctrine and one specific issue, one specific element that was uh, identified by Gerasimov as control of territory. Uh, the Russian side sees irregular formations in broader sense, in PMCs more specifically, uh, as a force that could be used against what Russia sees as, hi as hybrid threats. Uh, something that Russia is really seriously concerned with, starting from at least, has been concerned with, with starting from at least uh, the year 2000, uh, when the so-called bulldozer revolution occurred in Serbia, and then the post-Soviet area, and of course the Arab Spring. 
uh, intel gathering as well, geopolitical functions, so security expert or promotion of uh, Russia's national interests uh, through the use of these groups uh, that uh, promote, well, the Russian view, the Russian vision of security and stability. Uh, and thirdly, geoeconomic uh, or geostrategic factor, uh, something that uh, Russian observers call as Silovaya Economica or uh, the power economy, uh, which is, and I'm, quote, wow. I'm quoting, a state control system of coercion, uh, including a reliance on limited scale military conflict if necessary, aimed at uh, realizing, ec uh, realizing economic goals. Uh, so this is basically what Russia what Russia has been doing, uh, and yeah, <laughs> interesting. So why Africa? So first of all, as we can see here, large parts of Africa, uh, even some countries are, could be described as gray zones, uh, which is, b uh, well, in fact, what Russia really wants, what Russia really needs. Uh, the uh, threat of terrorism, and uh, especially in Nigeria and in some other countries, uh, Mozambique as well, uh, and, uh, de facto unpreparedness of local uh, military and armed forces to effectively and efficiently deal with the threat. They believe that Russia uh, that has been, fi has been fighting irregulars and terrorists domestically in Syria, uh, that Russia will be able to uh, help them with this type of operations. Uh, people versus the government. Uh, so we, c we saw protests in Sudan and allegedly Russian PMC members, the Wagner Group, was involved in suppression of the public rebellions. Um, failures of Western, uh, Western sorry, failures, countries uh, where we have seen, where we have observed uh, some of the Western failures. One of them is Operation Sangaris in the Central African Republic. Uh, and uh, the issue of economic sanctions, as I explained. Uh, uh, so here are some uh, alleged and actual locations uh, where Russian PMCs are present, uh, and some of the most interesting, uh, some of the most interesting case studies. Uh, so what we saw in Mozambique, and I'm not sure I'm interfering in, in any case, uh, what we have seen in Mozambique is quite telling. Uh, the Russian side, the Russian mercenaries have suffered. Uh, a visible defeat in Mozambique. They, they have actually lost uh, 10 members, 10 uh, mercenaries uh, over just a uh, couple of weeks. Um, it showed that uh, the Russian side, uh, the Russian mercenaries may not be prepared to fight on in these specific circumstances. Yes, indeed. Uh, if we refer to the Soviet experience, the Soviet Union did operate in Africa quite successfully, but there is uh, one huge difference between what we saw back then and today. Before that, uh, the Soviets were supporting uh, guerrilla fighters uh, and uh, irregulars. That is why they were successful. One specific example of Ethiopia, when they um, basically worked with the official government, didn't <coughs> go that well at all. And now, today, when the uh, Russian mercenaries have to operate against the local rebels, the local uh, irregulars, uh, this uh, also does not pan out the way uh, they were, uh, they thought they would. Uh, and yeah, basically. So Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very important segue because of the reason of looking at how uh, Islamic State in Mozambique is functioning, but also the other ethnographical and local issues and grievances that occur there, <coughs> and to compare and contrast Mozambique with other parts of the African continent. So with that in mind, Brian, please. Yeah. Um, can everyone hear me okay? So, uh, unfortunately, if everyone's looking for a lot of answers about the Islamic State in Mozambique, I don't have a lot of them, and basically no one does. Uh, I just came back from South Africa, a conference specifically on Mozambique, and we all basically left with, with the same questions of who exactly is responsible, what's their leadership structure, what is their ideology, uh, what exactly is, is behind all of this. Um, so over the past two years, there's uh, some 500 dead, hundreds of attacks, uh, a lot of it attributed to a local group, uh, Ansar al-Sunna, and in June, Islamic State Central Africa province started claiming responsibility for attacks. Um, so looking at Mozambique, uh, it is uh, very much a local phenomenon, but it's also, you can't talk about it at all without looking at 
uh, kind of the other currents throughout uh, that area of Africa, uh, East Africa and kind of the periphery. So looking at uh, Somalia, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and then uh, DRC as well. Um, there's all of these local factors and then there's the regional factors as well. So starting off with, you know, this isn't just a, when people say it's happening in northern Mozambique, it's not necessarily just northern Mozambique. It's, it's northern coastal Mozambique. It's uh, Cabo Delgado and Nampala. And then you have uh, the more inland uh, northern provinces of Nyasa, which it's, it's not occurring there. Uh, it's occurring along the coastline. Um, so looking at this, this trend towards uh, uh, broader jihadist ideology throughout the region, um, a lot of the most enduring armed groups in the area have been more of uh, political military uh, fighting, whether you're looking at the ADF who started to move more towards a uh, Islamist leaning, or if you're looking at the conflict between Renamo and Fl Flirimo. Um, it's started to turn though, and you can't look at what's happening in Mozambique without recognizing uh, the impact that Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia has had. Um, so starting off with, with some of the key things in, in Cabo Delgado, uh, Islam in Mozambique dates you know, back centuries, uh, primarily uh, Sufism on, on the Swahili coast that, that runs up through Tanzania. And this jihadist brand and this uh, more radical Islamist perspective isn't something that just uh, kind of appeared in, in Mozambique you know, in the past couple of years. It's, it's slowly been seeping in. It's been uh, brought from traders from the Gulf coming in for, for decades, but it's also increasingly started to seep in from Tanzania and those who have been uh, escaping conflicts in Somalia and the militant movements and radical preachers that have been uh, escaping from Kenya and moving into Tanzania to avoid government scrutiny. So you have this uh, overwhelmingly marginalized area. Cabo Delgado is uh, about 56% uh, Muslim, and it's the poorest province in, in all of Mozambique. And you have youth, uh, illiteracy rates have been getting worse and worse. You have uh, a population that is overwhelmingly disenfranchised by a government that's been concentrating power uh, in the south and in Maputo. Um, <clears throat> So there's this, this generational conflict that started to happen as uh, more and more radical preachers have, have moved in and disenfranchised youth have started to challenge the local Sufi order of Islam uh, and are getting more and more radical. There's an ethnic di dimension as well. There's the predominantly Muslim Wani people who sided with Ranamo and that didn't buy them very much goodwill with the government. And then you have the Makande people who have slowly moved into the coastal areas and increasingly have moved in and taken over their land and are responsible for running the businesses. Um, and as oil exploration is kicking up, more and more Makande people are moving in. And this radical Islam has, has started to seep in. And these youths have organized under Ansar al Sunna. Oh, sorry. Um, so the, the radical Islam that, that kind of underpins everything, a lot of it is attributed to, to coming in from, from Tanzania. Um, so we already have a, a highly combustible environment in, in northern Mozambique uh, with disenfranchised community members uh, that have started to break away from this historical practice of, of Sufi Islam. And at the same time, you have these illicit economies that are running from northern Mozambique into all of these other regional areas. Um, so we're going to look into some of the, the regional issues and how this has kind of progressed into, um, you know, a larger extremist movement. Um, so looking at Al-Shabaab in Somalia, it would be reductive to say that, that Al-Shabaab is, is responsible for it, but you can't ignore the, the threat that's emanating from uh, Al-Shabaab. Same way you can't ignore the fact that conflicts in DRC are emanating elsewhere. Um, so first, one of the big things is looking at, looking at Tanzania. So there's these connections between uh, like radical preachers in, in Kenya, like Abed Rogo, 
who escaped all of his followers, escaped from Kenya and scrutiny, and moved further into Tanzania. Um, excuse me. Um, so there's, there's a lot of questions in regard to who exactly Ansar al-Suna is. Uh, there's this debate over whether it's, uh, it's smugglers or if it's Islamists. And the government has also been uh, kind of debating it and downplaying it. Is it Islamic State? Is it local? Looking at the, the structures that have facilitated this, there's a youth that's broken away from uh, the older generation of Islam. There's all of these regional structures that uh, facilitate their existence. Uh, looking regionally, the existence of al-Shabaab, the existence of uh, ADF, they necessitate a, a large regional group of, of collaborators whether it's through uh, illicit finance and partners of convenience that span across the region. Um, if you actually look at the makeup of Ansar al-Sunna and the people involved in it, it's not just Mozambicans, it's Ugandans, it's Tanzanians, it's Somalis, it's Congolese. And there's all of these connections that you're looking at between the ADF, al-Shabaab, uh, and financing and illicit economies that run uh, throughout the region. Um, like I was mentioning, the radical preachers who have moved in uh, to Tanzania are connected to al-Shabaab uh, through an area of Tanzania known as Tanga. Um, they've been uh, radicalizing Tanzanians and sending them to al-Shabaab for several years. Tanga is also a major uh, illicit economy area where there's smuggling that's running through Mozambique into Tanga and into Somalia. There's also connections between um, ADF finances through Tanga as well. So there's this socialization that's been happening between uh, radical groups throughout the region, whether it's ADF, Somalia, and um, Ansar al Sunna. Then moving south as these radical preachers and this radical brand of Islam has started to seep into Mozambique. It's crept into an area of Tanzania known as Kabiti, which is also the, uh, the single largest amount of foreign fighters fighting for al-Shabaab are from Kabiti as well. Um, <clears throat> so getting into the I'm just going to move into the, the question of the Islamic State and whether or not there actually is uh, an Islamic State presence there. Um, there's very little evidence to actually suggest that the Islamic State is really, truly in Mozambique. The same goes for whether or not the Islamic State is really, truly in Democratic Republic of Congo with the ADF. Um, <clears throat> the way Ansar al Sunna is organized, it's probably several hundred fighters organized into 10 to 30 people cells. And they're claiming the Islamic State Central Africa province is only claiming a few attacks. There's been no drastic increase in their capabilities. The same can be said for, for ADF. This has all happened relatively slowly. There's still no, absolutely no propaganda to go, um, to give any insight into Ansar al Sunna or Islamic State Central Africa province. Um, what the general consensus is that it's likely there is some sort of communication happening between small cells of those who are responsible for the violence and the Islamic State. So there is some group within them that is communicating attacks back to uh, the Islamic State. But as far as an actual presence, it's not like uh, ISWAP or something like that, where it's an actual wholesale rebranding of the group. Um, there's no evidence to suggest that whatever, whatsoever. Uh, only recently have we actually started to see pictures of uh, Mozambicans being released by Islamic State. But all of the communications that have been put out have been entirely just claims. This is where an attack happened. This is how many people were killed. Uh, there's no sense of an ideology. There's no leadership structure. They're not announcing any goals at all. Um, 
and getting into uh, Russian PMC's involvement. Um, it's, it's not really any kind of a coincidence. I mean, I do agree that they did come in cheaper than whoever their rivals are, but if you look at uh, Russia's involvement overall and the relationship and the way it's built uh, Mozambique and, and Russia, there was a huge scandal where uh, the government got the what, $2 billion loan from Russia and that came out. It didn't go to parliament to, to get this loan. That came out. A uh, huge scandal about financing from Russia. And then Russia forgave some 95% of that. Shortly thereafter, there was the energy partnership and the military partnerships, and it only took uh, what, a few a month or two before the first Navy vessels were, were seen in the ports. Um, so I don't think it's any coincidence that, that Wagner is, is the PMC that won. And they arrived after an already extremely heavy-handed response by the Mozambican military. Mozambican military came in, shut down mosques, they arbit arbitrarily detained hundreds of people, and this is all just feeding into more and more of this ethnic rivalry between the Mwani people and the Makande people because they overwhelmingly detained the Mwani people who the majority of those in Ansar al Sunnah are from the Mwani ethnic group. Uh, and Wagner came in woefully unprepared to deal with, uh, deal with the issue. They came in with a lot of high-tech uh, equipment, they came in with drones, they came in with absolutely no understanding of, of what was actually happening on the ground. And even the Mozambican military can't point to exactly who's in these groups, uh, who's responsible for all of it, because it's not just Mozambicans, it's, it's Ugandans, it's Tanzanians, it's, it's Kenyans. Uh, and its local people. So if the Mozambican military can't tell, uh, can't tell anyone who's responsible for it and who to target, how, how would Wagner know? Um, so they're bringing in this technology, they're bringing in drones, uh, which don't even work. The, the vegetation is too dense, they can't use them, uh, and they've just been hit in hit and run attacks and just absolutely uh, kind of devastated them, knocked them off track pretty much you know, right after this all happened um, and forced them to, to retreat. Um, but as far as where things move from here, there's all of these, uh, all of these structures in place as far as um, smuggling networks that have been funding the ADF, that have been funding Somalia, that are uh, extremely important to northern Mozambique. It's, it's a major smuggling hub, whether it's of, of ivory from the national parks there or of timber, it's all moving out of ports in uh, northern Mozambique. And all of these structures are gonna be what entrenches and facilitates uh, uh, a jihadist group's survival in the area. If they start to receive more funding the Islamic State could certainly potentially take root there. There's uh, clearly an appetite for more jihadist ideology now, but for the time being, it's uh, it's likely just a, a small group of several hundred people responsible for the violence that are actually communicating back to the Islamic State. Thank you, Brian, very yeah. much. Uh, it's now four o'clock. I think we have uh, how many minutes? Yeah, that was terrible. Oh, okay, uh, so please, uh, questions uh, for the panels. Uh, right here, please. Thank you, guys. Um, so I have a question. Oh, please identify oh. yourself. So I, Ashley, I know it's at the again. end of the day. Some of us weren't here earlier. So. Sorry, post lunch coma. Um, <laughs> So I have a question, I guess, for um, the last two panelists who spoke. Um, it's kind of a combination of Russian PMC issues and Mozambique. Given the fiasco that was the Wagner situation in Mozambique, do we think um, that incident had either a positive or negative overall um, impact on um, the security situation in Mozambique? Um, and do we, do we see what happened there potentially bolstering the morale or demonstrating the capability of the, the as Brian mentioned, the, the small number of, of individuals responsible for the violence? Yeah, yeah I'll redeem myself after this. Um, no, I think it's been a, it's a, it's a massive problem. Um, even before the first uh, 
attack on 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 Wagner, the first deaths, uh, there was already uh, people on the ground were already seeing issues rising up between Wagner and and the military of of this understanding, uh, not knowing how the roles were being delineated, uh, not trusting one another at all. Uh, there, I mean, there was no local context that that Wagner had. They they had no idea what they were prepared for. Uh, who's who, uh, who should be, uh, operations shouldn't target, say, the Makande people, which, uh, you know, have overwhelmingly been the ones who have, who have been targeted by Ansar al-Sunnah, um, which, like I said, is mostly Mwani. Um, so there was already this, this deep uh, mistrust between uh, the locals and all of a sudden seeing, uh, you know, Russian PMCs coming in, and then there is... Uh, more and more mistrust and, and frustration between Wagner and between, um, between them. And any sort of uh, heavy-handed response like this without actually figuring out what these people want is just going to entrench it even further. Yeah, I'll add. Uh, so aside from uh, 10 people from the Wagner group, some 20 uh, military members of the military personnel, local military personnel were killed so as Brian rightfully said, there is no clear division against whom to fight because it's not just about the radical Muslims. In fact, there is a combination of animism, Muslim, some tribalism. So Wagner, the mm -hmm. Russian side, will never be able to figure out who the real threat is. In fact, if we go back to history, we'll see that in Africa, uh, the Soviet military instructors there was a huge gap in uh, cultural gap, huge gap in understanding between the locals and the Soviets. And if you read the memoirs uh, of the Soviet military, uh, they had huge problems in Libya, well, let alone Angola or other countries. They did nev never did figure mm -hmm. out how to deal with the locals. So by and large, um, aside from certain uh, tactical successes, uh, the Soviet involvement, military involvement in Africa uh, was a uh, visible collapse. I mean, the, it was complete unsuccess. And the deeper they went in local affairs, uh, the worse the results were, in fact. And I think quickly on, on something that I, I kind of glazed over, and that is uh, it's, it's really unclear exactly, because there isn't any sign of an, uh, a cohesive group of what makes up Ansar al-Sunnah, what makes up this alleged Islamic State Central Africa province. There's a lot of question as to whether or not uh, how much of this violence is related to the illicit economies there, the smuggling of goods, um, because there it's I mean it's a massive route for all kinds of things, everything from heroin that comes into Mozambique and then onward to uh, onward to South Africa or uh, minerals, rubies, timber. If all of these uh, groups that are involved in that illicit economy, they are incentivized to ensure that it remains uh, an impermissible security environment because the second it is, uh, then all of a sudden there's going to be a securitization of that area of Mozambique with uh, foreign oil companies coming in with security guards. Uh, the coastline is going to become more and more secure. It's going to be more and more difficult to route all the smuggled goods out of Mozambique. So how many of these attacks on security forces uh, were groups, uh, organized crime groups? How many were actually jihadist groups? Uh, j just one last comment. So uh, just yesterday I uh, read an article uh, by a number of uh, prominent Russian experts on Africa, and they are already alarmed. They're saying that Russia should not, even through mercenaries, should not involve itself in uh, inter-African affairs because uh, there is zero understanding of the local environment. There was zero understanding of local environment even during the Soviet times when uh, the Russian, the Soviet, sorry, Africanists were by far better. Today, there is zero understanding. And uh, fighting a war in a jungle, I mean, this is something that Wagner has never done before. Fighting in Syria along with uh, the VKS uh, and the special operation forces uh, and some help and support from the side of uh, well, other players. Uh, fighting in Ukraine, that's a totally different ball game than fighting in against some tribal tribals, I mean, uh, enemies and uh, in the unfamiliar environment. Uh, next question, uh, right here, please. Hi 
Um, Nora Updegrove, uh, State Department. Um, my question was for Jacob, please. Um, I actually was in Burkina Faso doing um, CV work with local um, chronic schools groups. And you mentioned that there's no one really able to step to the plate in the Sahel right now from an external perspective. What are you seeing that governments can do that work? I mean, I know about the G5 Sahel and I know the challenges the Kabore government is having, but what are you seeing in Niger that works? What can governments do to actually stem the flow of this or is it all negative? Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really hard question. Um, so the one positive thing that I mentioned about Nigeria is, is sort of ironic because it took Nigeria to face Boko Haram and see what they've seen after like seven or eight years and actually suffer from it in order for their religious establishment to come around. And in the rhetoric of the Salafi clerics now, I mean, they're, they're apologetic and they're, they're against jihad and they, they speak about, you know, jihad means, you know, peaceful things and jihad, you know, just like these typical moderates that in CVE we try to create. But it wasn't actually CVE, a program that created these Salafi clerics to do it. It's happening very organic because they realize the consequences of the rhetoric. Now, to the extent that the religious establishment in these countries may have played some role in, in what's happening with the violence in Mali and Burkina, it might actually take, you know, in a way, some suffering in order for them to become their own antidote and to realize that the ideology that they were preaching has turned into this. Like there is something going on with the burning of these schools in uh, Burkina Faso that of course is similar to Boko Haram ideology. And I don't think that's coming from nowhere. I think it was sort of the anti-Western education ideology. Um, so uh, yeah, at one point we can encourage preachers to do that on the ideological level, but I think on another level it will come from the suffering that they will change. Um, and in terms of things that, that, w that work, another problem is like the spillover effects. You know, just because Burkina Faso is being hit with attacks, it doesn't always mean that it's structural problems within Burkina Faso that is the cause, because I mean, it's clearly coming from the border area and like the Mali problem happened and then you had Burkina, Burkina Abis go fight in 2013 and then they started Ansar al-Islam. So part of it's not even necessarily Burkina's fault. Um, but to the extent that, you know, things that, that work, uh, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, I guess in the case of Niger, compared to other countries, um, you know, it is a multi-ethnic country, and uh, I've noticed that their, you know, vigilante patrols that they do tend to incorporate all of the different ethnic groups uh, in them, and, you know, by bringing in people from all across the country to combat, uh, you know, Boko Haram, which has not taken root too much in their country, or to combat, um, you know, AQIM, ha has worked just by by being you know, inclusive of the different ethnic groups and making it sort of a national priority. And I don't know how much Burkina is doing that, but maybe that's a place where you could ask Burkina people to go to Niger and learn from them, if that is indeed working in Niger. That's one thing that those programs sometimes do. Can I, can I add Please. something on this, actually? Uh, I mean, what just Jacob said on Niger is very interesting also if you look at how Niger reacted to the Arab Spring uh, in Libya because like I remember the debates around April 2011 and the concerns at the time were, were about were about the potential collapse, collapse of Niger more than Mali and instead Niger managed to actually bring in like Tuareg groups etc something that Mali despite all you know like the past problems they had that they failed to do so and this is where like the, the entire situation started collapsing. So like on this Niger, I think they tend to have like a bit better capacity in understanding on how to be inclusive, like different than many like countries like in the region. Uh, my, sir. Uh, just a quick uh, comment and question. Uh, uh, basically, I, what Jake, it's Michael Ryan, by the way, James. Um, Jacob, you, you mentioned that, that some of, I guess it was in Nigeria and only in Nigeria, some of the ordinary um, Salafi uh, preachers uh, took up and tried to do something about, about um, joining these groups or against the group. Uh, just, I'm just interested if you saw any, um, I mean, they tried a similar thing in, in the Sinai and in Egypt where the Azhar you know, preachers went out and, and tried to talk to people, and, and, and they had a, others even from the Delta, and they absolutely were unsuccessful. Um, nobody, just nobody listened to them, because once they crossed the radical line, they, you know, they, 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 they couldn't argue them back. Um, did, did you see anything like, I mean, is there a different dynamic in Nigeria that's working, or is this just something that's too early to tell, or, or, or is there any hope? 
Yeah, I think actually the cat is already out of the bag. Like it's already a little bit too late for them to go back and change the rhetoric because Boko Haram and ISOP, they're, they're already marching forward. And uh, you know the time was 10 years ago for them to say the things that they're saying now. So they, they might actually help discourage some youths now from joining those groups, but those groups already you know, are able to, to move up on their own. And in fact, I mean, now that the ideology of uh, Boko Haram and ISOP is so developed, they have been able to use the Salafi cleric's own statements now as evidence that they're basically infidels because they say, you've just backtracked. You were talking about jihad back in the day. You are talking about democracy is not compatible with Islam, and now you're saying it is. So I mean, they're able to use it against them and I mean, even those ideological arguments that democracy is incompatible with Islam, I mean, it's not like you cannot find the Salafi clerics from Saudi Arabia having said those same things. So it's not like ISWAP has no grounding at all either. Okay. Dario, um, please explain to an American audience uh, the European experience, <laughs> I know. the European experience with colonialism in Libya and, and can you explain to the American audience why, why France, of all countries, is supporting uh, Mr. Heftar in Libya along with the Russians? And, and, and also explain to us why the U.S. government recognizes the GNA in Tripoli, and virtually every Western government supports the GNA and recognizes it, but what is France up to? You have 45 and seconds. And explain to us in one minute, <laughs> explain in one minute, how does this relate okay, to France's so activities right. in Africa? I guess this, wasn't, this was actually a debate that was ongoing yesterday on Twitter. So to put it bluntly and very quickly, uh, mm, this, uh, the French people will tell you that they want to, to, to have the stabilization of Libya. Uh, myself, as a person who did a PhD in Mediterranean studies with a very significant focus on history and cultural, and like, and a cultural focus, I will tell you that for France, the idea of bringing Libya into its sphere of influence is something that traced back to the end of the 19th century, when they were trying to push towards East, uh, Eastern Libya from the Sahel. At that time, the Italians, like the young new nation, like uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, because Italy unified in 1861, uh, provided the weapons to the tribes in Eastern Libya to face the arrival of the French. The, sa the very same weapons were used by Libyans against the Italians 10 years later, <laughs> when the Italians started the colonial enterprise in, in Libya. So the thing is that I tend to see this French approach to Libya, the, no, namely the approach that Sarkozy, who was the most important supporter of the NATO operation against Gaddafi back in 2011, I, I tend to see this in this historical framework. Basically, this idea that there is a missing link in the French, let's say, influence in Libya. And I would say that these days, this is even more important because French influence is a bit declining in Algeria, is a bit declining in, in Tunisia. Like, the end of Bouteflika was a significant blow for, for France. And this is something that the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the, G of the GNA, uh, Siala, he said that in Rome last weekend during the Rome Med Dialogues that were organized in Italy. Then, very quickly on the US, there is no one position uh, from the American government, the American administration on Libya. Uh, I saw on Twitter one hour ago this statement from Pompeo uh, about like um, the no military solution for Libya. And the State Department is very much like supportive of the GNA. I would say especially after it became clear that Wagner is in Libya. You can see the communique that was issued like mid-November after Fatih Bashaga, who is the real, I would say, the real leader of the GNA at the moment. We covered him months ago, calling him the rising star of uh, the Libyan politics for militant leadership monitor of the James Now. Instead, you can see that from the White House, the approach is, is a bit different in the sense that the influence on the White House of uh, a number of allies who are supportive, not France, of course, like I would never say something like this, but for instance, the connections between the White House and the Emirates, the connections between the White House and Egypt, they have an influence in, uh, we all remember this phone call in April 
that created a bit of, of, of a mess that Trump basically uh, supported after. So on that, I would say that there is some sort of inconsistency between different branches of the administration, but then at the same time, there is an overall lack of interest for what's going on in Libya. Uh, AFRICOM still operates there, but it's nothing that can be compared to the kind of the engagement that the Americans had in the region until two, 10 years ago. On, on this, I think it's, uh, and to make it clear, it's not something related to this current administration. It's a trend that started already under Obama. On this, like I see a significant continuity between uh, like the, the, the Asian like uh, pivot, as we call it, and the decline of the interest on the Mediterranean quagmire, let's say, and what's going and these ongoing like elements of this in lack of interest, I would say, from from Washington towards the region. I manage. <laughs> okay.